All right. Thank you so much for the invitation to come speak to some other philosophers here. I self-identify as an aspiring philosopher since I don't have formal training in philosophy, but it's something that I've taken great interest in and I have my own way of digging into different corners of emerging paradigms and the types of philosophies that I'd say are not necessarily the mainstream yet. And so I take a very pluralistic approach of trying to synthesize all these different frameworks together for my own sense, for my direct embodied experience to create some conceptual frameworks to help understand my embodied experiences within XR. So today I'm gonna be talking about the process philosophy and VR, the foundations of experiential design. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about these different things today. So what is experience and some of the deeper philosophical context for process, experiential design framework that I have that I'll go into quality, story, context, and character. And then for each of those, I'll do a little bit of a a sidebar for some of the philosophical concepts for each of these. And then a little bit of a process philosophy primer, and then looking at both the perception as process and design as process. All right, so let's first look at what is experience. So there was a piece in the Harvard Business Review back in like 1999. It was called Welcome to the Experience Economy by Pine and Gilmore. And they talk about this progression of economic value that goes from commodities to goods to services to staging experiences. And so we're kind of moving beyond goods and services into experiences. And so a lot of companies like Starbucks are actually producing experiences for the customer. And so it's got this whole list of different aspects from the services and experiences. And if you look at the definition of experience, there's different things that it's memorable, it's personal, it's revealed over a duration of time, it's someone who's a guest and you have different embodied sensations. So if I look up the definition of experience, it's a process of doing and seeing things and having things happen to you. So experience is a process that unfolds over time. And when you think about something unfolding in time, you can think about it in terms of a story and how some stories have like a three act structure. But of course, not all experiences are nicely bound into this type of narrative structure, but there might be a beginning, middle and end generally to something that's unfolding over a period of time. You have the Joseph Campbellian hero's journey where you're going out and you're having some sort of ordeal and you're coming back, but there's some evolution and growth that happens over that course of time. But it's also an experience as a process that unfolds over time. And even when you look at the philosophy of time, what is time? So if we're talking about experience, we have to also start to consider what time is. And so Aristotle, when he's talking about time, I like his definition, which is a number of change with respect to the before and the after. So this is from physics book four, 219b. So I have this video here. This is the moon libration. So the moon kind of wobbles back and forth, but it's going through a cycle of the earth relative to the moon, but also relative to the sun. So as the moon goes around the earth, you're getting the sense of a lunation cycle here, which is a little over 27 days. But also if you think about the course of a day, the day is a diurnal rotation of the earth where the sun is going around. And so you get the sense of a day, you get the sense of a month here for the moon, and you get the sense of a year by the time it takes the earth to take a, a full solar rotation around the sun. So as you look at time, you can look at things relative to each other. So two objects relative to each other and how they move relative to each other gives you these different periods of time. There's also longer periods of time if you start to look at the cycle between Venus and the Earth. So this is Earth in the center here and it's the geocentric orbital rotation. So the sun is here and then the Venus is going around the sun. And as it goes around, you can see that this is eight Earth solar orbits and then 13 Venus solar orbits, and there's five points when they conjunct here. But this pattern here is a representation that actually unfolds over eight years. So you could say this spatial representation between the relationship between the Earth and Venus is around eight years. But each of the planets actually have their own cycles relative to each other, and it you know, goes all the way up to like Neptune and Pluto is about 494 years, and you have different periods of time through each of these different planets. So this is kind of like a shape to create both a spatial representation of time, but also a relational representation of time of two bodies relative to each other. Okay, so that's a lot about the chronos time, but the Greeks also had two words for time. There's the chronos time, which is sort of the unfolding of the time that could be measured. And then there's the kairos time, which was the quality of the moment of the time. And this is where I think we get into some of the more interesting philosophical aspects of like, what is the kairos? What is the quality of the moment of the time? So as we look at the kairos, it's the right time to act, but it's also implying that there might be 
other dimensions beyond space and time that start to get into these concepts of potential. And potential is going to be a huge concept when it comes to process philosophy, and we'll be digging into that a little bit more. But the Greeks would talk about it as a sense of doing the right thing at the right time. So that's the Kairos time. So when we talk about process philosophy, this is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy definition. They start off saying that process philosophy is based on the premise that being is dynamic and that the dynamic nature of being should be the primary focus of any comprehensive philosophical account of reality and our place within it. Even though we experience our world and ourselves as continuously changing, Western metaphysics has long been obsessed with describing reality as an assembly of static individuals whose dynamic features are either taken to be mere appearances or ontologically secondary and derivative. So there's a lot of focus within analytic tradition that turns things into objects. Say consciousness is a property of the physical aspect of your neurology firing, as an example, it's the kind of eliminative materialistic perspective of consciousness. But I think a lot of the process relational approaches put process as being fundamental so that you could actually have consciousness as more of a fundamental field. Panpsychism is something that is often linked to Alfred North Whitehead and also William James and a number of different theorists in the, in the analytic tradition, Philip Goff's recent book covering panpsychism. Because there's the hard problem of consciousness, like how do you get consciousness out of material reality? And the answer could be that every little bit of reality has a bit of consciousness, or you could start to say that there's something that's more deeper than material reality, that there's actually these aspects of qualia or consciousness, or David Ray Griffith has actually called Whitehead's perspective is more pan-experientialism, meaning that he sees that all of reality is experience. So that's a process philosophy where you see this difference between substance metaphysics and process relational metaphysics, where there's an order where physics, chemistry, biology, and psychology, but at the basis are this assumption of material reality. I say assumption because it's a metaphysical assumption and there's no proof one way or another as to what is the ground of the metaphysical reality. For process relational metaphysics, they're claiming that the ultimate basis of reality is both process and relationship and potential, and that you could describe all of reality by Whitehead's concept of myriology, which is a whole part relationships. So it's a whole part series of event sequences that are in relationship to each other, and they're being adopted by each other in this kind of fractally nested unfolding. And it's through this philosophy of organism that Whitehead comes up with. That's kind of a big paradigm shift, and I'll have a number of other ways of digging into that, especially through aspects of quantum ontology to unpack that a little bit more. But the basis is that if you want to have the fundamental building blocks of all of nature of reality, process relational and process philosophers say that you could just use processes and relationships, that you could look at the quantum relationships as an ecological patterned relationships of energy relative to each other, and that that's all you need to be able to describe all of reality. So a number of different process relational theorists is Heraclitus and other branches of philosophy from a Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, indigenous philosophy, Buddhism and Taoism, all of them have process relational orientations, but also Bruno, Spinoza, Leibniz, Schelling, Bergson, Pierce, James, Dewey. Alfred North Whitehead is a big focus in terms of the 20th century philosophers that were really pushing forth the process relational paradigm shift. He was a mathematician, but also put forth this pretty radical metaphysical framework that has had huge impact on ecological movements and systems theory and philosophy of biology and quantum ontology and a whole number of different approaches. But one of his students is Charles Hearthstone, and then Sellers, Bateson, Deleuze, Rescher, Latour, Stengers, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Jung, Teher de Chardin, and Bohm. So if you're familiar with any of these, then these are kind of in the realm of process relational theorists, and these are all happen to be the type of thinkers that I tend to get drawn to. So Whitehead's process philosophy, he says that these actual entities or that you can describe the nature of the universe as determined by its eternal relations to other actual entities. And his metaphysical framework, I'm not going to dig into all the specific nuances of it, but suffice to say is that the relationality is a big part of process relational metaphysics. So another big thing that I just want to bring up at this point is that the map is not the territory. I'm a huge fan of different frameworks, and there's a tendency to try to like say that these frameworks are a one-to-one -one mapping of reality. And I think Korbinski, who said that the map is not the territory, but there was also a pretty famous thing that Whitehead said, which was the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is that you start to create these frameworks and then you project onto that 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 is reality. And I think that Whitehead would actually say that the substance metaphysics is actually a fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And Bergson also talked about it, like the distortion of nature due to the intellectual spatialization of things. 
So it's the process when you spatialize the expression of more concrete facts under the guise of very abstract logical constructions. And so he sees this as kind of a logical error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete. And so he calls it the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And the author of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the entry of process philosophy was actually Johanna Seidt. And she's got this piece called The Myth of the Substance and the Fallacy of Misplaced Concreteness, where she concludes that the category of substance doesn't actually provide us with a uniquely powerful explanation for the notion of logical and physical unity. So there's more if you want to dig into the, I'm not going to dig into the nuances of that debate, but Sight has a number of different alternative ontologies beyond substance metaphysics. So there's state affairs ontologies, trope ontologies, attribute ontologies, and process ontologies. I'll be posting all of my notes here. So if you want to check out some of these citations and dig into some of this more, but I'll be focusing specifically on the process ontologies. All right. So again, we have the substance metaphysics and the process relational metaphysics, where I point out that the basis of the substance metaphysics is physics. And there's a shift where Whitehead is putting biology as the basis so that you could use biological metaphors to be able to describe the lowest quantum realities to human nature, to the largest degrees of what's happening in the cosmos. All right, so this is a, a metaphor that I'd like to look at, which is a concentric wave singularity. This is a concentric circle where they're having pulsing at a certain frequency, and you're seeing that eventually these waves collide to create this 90-foot spike of water. And I like this as a metaphor for imagining that there's these waves of potential that are beyond space and time, these non-local fields, and that they're somehow combining. And then as they combine, then they sort of break through. You can think of it as kind of the metaphoric collapse of the wave function. And when that wave function collapses, then there's the translation of potential into actuality. And then I think the process relational approaches is saying that the potentials are actually real. Something like the Everett Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics is trying to take all of the potentials and actualize them into a spatialized parallel universe that you can't observe. So there's a resistance to trying to accommodate different aspects of potential. And Whitehead, just as a background, he was a mathematical physicist. And so he was teaching as a mathematician. He was very up to speed with what was happening with general relativity, arguably one of the first people to really comprehend what Einstein was saying, given his background in mathematics and mathematical physics, but also was in dialogue with what was happening with the quantum ontologies. And so he ended up taking a professorship at Harvard, where he did a lot of different teaching, where he was synthesizing his ideas of being dissatisfied after the Principia Mathematica, which was the point where he was trying to set the foundation of all mathematics and logic with Bertrand Russell. That failed after Gödel came back with the incompleteness theorem. And Bertrand Russell went on to kind of found the analytic tradition of philosophy with the basis of logic. And then Whitehead was liberated to be able to go off and be a little bit more experimental and using his mathematical brain to start to define other metaphysical frameworks that were going to be more encompassing for more aspects of the nature of reality, meaning that there was a lot more to math than just logic, i.e. that there was a lot of aspects of intuition and feeling and discovering mathematical intuitions was that there was something beyond just logic. All right, so that's just a little bit more context. So what is reality? So there is a, the whole David Chalmers' virtual realism that he presented as a series of lectures in 2016, the virtual and the real, and he had a number of different questions. And so he was asking, are virtual objects real or fictional? Do virtual events really happen or not? Are virtual experiences non-illusionary or illusionary? And are experiences in VR as valuable or not as valuable as experiences outside of it? So I think these series of questions actually address different metaphysical assumptions that you have. Because if you have the physicalist materialistic orientation and you say that all of reality is based upon material concrete stuff, I mean, even virtual reality is created as a dialectic between the virtual and the real that creates, in my mind, a false bifurcation between our experiences, which could actually go beyond the physical realities. Whether it's consciousness is fundamental or just in general, you don't have to make a metaphysical assumption. It's just the fact that you're saying that something is real or not real. So with the physicalism, then you have the tendency to say, well, these virtual objects are obviously fictional, that these events are not really happening, that the virtual experiences are illusionary, and that experiences in VR are not as valuable as ones outside of it. So this is the metaphysical foundation that I think are easy to come to. But if you say that consciousness is fundamental, or if there's something deeper, say a more process relational approach, then you're looking at it in terms of the human experience, independent of what type of mediation you're having your experience from. 
So then virtual objects are real, the virtual events do really happen, the virtual experiences are non-illusionary, and the experiences in VR are just as valuable as experiences outside of it. So these questions also, like, I was sort of dissatisfied from the existing traditional metaphysical approaches of substance metaphysics, because I don't think it's very robust. You could also argue that you don't need to make a metaphysical shift, but I find when talking about experiential design, that it's easier to talk about it in terms of consciousness and experience is fundamental. And when you start from there, then you start to build everything else around that. All right, so again, the Western metaphysics has long been obsessed by describing reality as a series of these static objects, and that all the qualitative and the qualia and all these other features are ontologically secondary or derivative. Okay, so that's that. So now I'm gonna dig into a little bit of the experiential design framework. So this was cultivated over the last seven years or so. As I've been going through experiences, I try to find different sense-making frameworks for me to find the language to describe the different trade-offs and the different aspects of the experiences. And so it's quality, story, context, and character. And then I'll be giving a little bit of brief philosophical sidebars at the end of each of these sections, different issues that come up. And then I'll be diving into the process philosophy primer and then looking at perception and design. Okay, so there's this quote from Margaret McKee that says, true character is revealed in the choices the human being makes under pressure. And then the greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation that you have, then the truer the choice, the character's essential nature. In other words, you're put under pressure and you're making choices and taking action. And those choices that you're making are the revealing of your character. So you're placed within that context, you're making choices, taking action, character is revealed, and the process is unfolding over time. So to abstract this out, these are kind of like elements of storytelling, but they're also the elements of experience and the element of processes because there's a context, a quality, a character, and a story. So I'm gonna first look at the quality. So the quality, I look at some of the different existing communication media from video games and human computer interaction from web design and narrative design and mobile phones. And then there's the emotional presence that you get from film and lighting and music. And then you have the embodied and environmental presence that comes from hijacking your sensory motor contingencies, but also different aspects of architecture and environmental presence and theater and dance. So you have the active presence from the video games and mental and social presence from cruising the web and talking to your friends on social media and on the phone. You have emotional presence and then embodied and environmental presence. Now, each of these are all happening all at the same time. And there's a center of gravity of which ones that you're really focused in on. So it's about taking action and making choices, emotional immersion, and sensory experience. Now you can look at a progression of communication media over time where let's just assume that the very first form was oral storytelling and then eventually theater. And then there was the printed books and then film, radio, TV, video games, internet, mobile phones, and VR and AR. So at each time there's a new communication media, it's both including the previous media, but also transcending the limitations of the previous and there's new affordances. And I have roughly correlated to each new affordance, say like video games as an example, is all about active presence. And there's a lot of aspects of film and television. So very much about building and releasing tension over time to cultivate an emotional presence. And then VR and AR is a lot about embodiment and different aspects of your environmental presence, but also including all the previous media. But the sense of presence is really the thing that's new and different. And Mel Slater has really been a pioneer of not only doing a lot of embodiment research, but also doing the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, the place illusion and plausibility illusion is the two fundamental illusions that he says are a part of virtual reality. And to break these out, the place illusion is that you feel like you have this sense of being in another place and that place is real. And that the plausibility illusion is that you believe that it's real, even though you know it's not real, but there's an illusion that tricked your brain and thinking it is real good enough to the point where it creates the illusion. Now, there's lots of different theories of presence out there. I personally am a fan of Dustin Chertoff, who has a very similar theory to the elemental theory that I have. He independently created this before I did and before I discovered it, but he was looking at advertising and how experiential design had originated from the marketing field, where it was used to encourage people to create meaningful and emotional social connections to a product. Going back to the Pine and Gilmore and the experiential age, the frontiers of experiential marketing had broken out that there was sensory, cognitive, effective, active and relational. As I break that out, there's the active, cognitive and relational, effective and sensory. That's Chertoff's and mine is active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. 
Now, there's lots of other aspects of presence theory. This by no means is a comprehensive theory. I think there's always going to be incomplete aspects. And so there's other surveys of different aspects and going into more details of it. But on the whole, I'd say themes that come up again and again, even this is the summary from Scarbaz, where he talks about social presence and place illusion, plausibility illusion, and co-presence, you know, social dimensions and plausibility in place. And the thing that's not in here that I would say is the emotional aspect. All right, so that's the quality. But you can look at the qualities from fire, air, earth, and water, which of course goes back to ancient philosophy, Empedocles with earth, air, fire, and water. He says that his assumption is that the four eternally existing roots, the arrangement and rearrangement of which account for all the genesis and oluthros, and for the particular and changing characteristics of the Neda. So it starts with Empedocles and then goes on and transmitted through different aspects of ancient philosophy. You know, there's hot, cold, wet, and dry as you look at the different elements. So there's a tetradic dialectic between these two poles between hot, cold, wet, and dry. And the origins, this is from an Empedocles extant fragments, it actually gets traced back to medical origins, going back to Philistine, but also the Hippocratic nature of man and connecting to the phlegm, blood, yellow, and black bile. But in essence, that you could say that there's a combination of hot and dry is fire, hot and wet is air, wet and cold is water, and wet and dry is earth. A way of intuitively breaking that out is that on one way is giving outward and receiving inward, and then the dry is sort of the individuating and the wet is a little bit more bonding. Again, this is rough approximations of trying to give an intuition for how it translates into the active presence, mental social presence, emotional presence, and embodied presence. But there's also Chinese philosophy that has the concepts of the yang and the yin, which is very much connected to the fire and the air for the yang and the earth and the water for the yin, where there's more of a receptive and active aspects, where one is more outward and one is more inward, one is more giving, one is more receiving, one is more talking and one is more listening. And these are some of the different correspondences for the yang and the yin. But I think the dialectic between these, you could also go into the left brain, right brain, you know, many different ways in which the concepts of dialectic in general are a part of the qualitative process. So as we look at the different aspects of the quality, now I'm going to just go to a brief sidebar for some of these and just kind of a quick hit. So for me, I think a lot about pluralism, trying to blend together different aspects of Chinese philosophy, natural philosophy, ancient philosophy, philosophy perception, different aspects of qualia. Then there's the incompleteness of language for experiences, how our languages that we have are always going to be not as robust as our direct experiences. And I'll talk about why that is. Pierce's triads and then the dialectics and polarities. So the pluralism and the philosophy of math, I had a chance to talk to Michelle Friend. She's a philosopher of math. I talked to her at the joint mathematics meeting in Baltimore, I think back in like 2019. I got into sort of platonic mathematic ideas and was talking to different philosophers of mathematics. But she was actually suggesting that pluralism as a foundation, meaning that that's kind of an oxymoron because it's unstable. But her definition is that the pluralist and foundations believe that there's insufficient evidence to think that there is a unique foundation for mathematics. Moreover, the pluralist and foundations works under the assumption that there is no reason to think that there will be a convergence to a unique theory in the future. He or she takes seriously the possibility that there are several together inconsistent foundations in mathematics. This is sort of getting into the girdles and completeness where any framework you have is going to be incomplete and really embracing that as kind of a pluralistic approach saying that each foundational idea and framework is going to reveal some aspect of realities, but it's also going to be occluding other aspects of reality. So it's important to have a pluralistic blending of lots of different approaches, which I think is part of why I am scattered across all these different approaches. But it's also the bandwidth of our senses is very small in terms of what we're able to actually take in. There's so much of our conscious awareness that goes beyond our sight, touch, hearing, and smell that our body is unconsciously processing. And it's sub-symbolic. We can't even put words to it. It's something that goes beyond even the language. And so Jungian theories have different aspects of the unconscious that speak to that. Bradley has different aspects of the actualization that goes into the monadic, dyadic, triadic, and tetradic. And this is sort of the sidebar, so I'm not going to dig into great detail. Suffice to say that something like the dialectic is both the polarity, but also the synthesis of the polarity is the triadic aspect of that. Integration and Difference from Grant Maxwell. He's discussing in an upcoming book I'm really looking forward to. He's a process relational thinker that's blending together aspects of Spinoza, Leibniz, Hegel, Schelling, Nietzsche, James Bergson, Jung, Whitehead, Derrida, Deleuze, Hillman, and Stengers, all thinking about these dialectical thinking through philosophical history. Tim Eastman talks about the triads and philosophy, and Pierce has got the semiotics with the interpretant, representant, and object. And then there's a new book that came out recently that I've been really digging into, which is called Collective Essays and Speculative Philosophy. And James Bradley does this great 
survey of all these different philosophers and starting to break out the different tradic theories of actualization. And I think why this is important for me is that you have something that's indifferentiated aspects, and then you start to make some sort of differentiation. And from that differentiation, then you start to have order. So I think the foundations of perception start to get into these underlying tradic theories of actualization. And again, there's some more references to dig into that from the appendix. That's all the qualities. Now moving on to the story. So the story, you have the Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. You have Dan Harmon's story circle. You have the three act structure. And then you have this story is the unfolding of what's happening and changing over time. So there's something that's happening and there's different frameworks to understanding the story. I like this from Alex McDowell because he's saying that back in the days before linear media, there used to be a tribal nature of the oral storytelling tradition, which meant that the story was never fixed. It was always dynamic and participatory, where you tell a story and it would be a communal process and it would change and adapt as the culture adapted. I mean, I guess we have that still today with the reinterpretation of like Dune was just reimagined, but the tendency to have like a canonical version of the media that started with the printing press. And I think we're moving back into this world that has more participation. And I'd say a key part of that participation is potential. And the potential is a key part philosophically of process philosophy is trying to reintegrate different aspects of potential. So thinking about potential is going to allow you to understand the future of interactive storytelling where you have uh, Lebowitz and King has a spectrum of authored versus generative stories where you have from one end, it's completely authored. On the other end, you have different aspects of more gamified dimensions of the storytelling. So on one end, you have no agency or impact on the story. On the other end, it's more of like a maximized agency and expression of your will. And then you have kind of a passive experience with static particle-like actuals. And then the other end, you have the participatory experience with dynamic waves of potential. So kind of using the quantum ontology metaphors to say that one is the substance static thing and the other has these waves of potential and possibility. And then you have the philosophical references for a story, the importance of potential, the block model versus participatory universe, time, and then the debate between Einstein and Bergson around duration. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about context now. So that was quality, then story, now context. So context is something that when you think about world building, you have to think about building and describing all different scales of reality that you're translating different aspects of culture into a world. Like just think of the Black Panther and all the different world that they had to create with Wakanda and all the different aspects of what's the medical, what's the technology, what's the infrastructure for travel. And so thinking about all these different things, this is the mandala that Alex McDowell has. And I'd say the key part here is that this is really describing a system of context. There's lots of other contexts. These are the different domains of human experience that I've used to talk about different ethical and moral dilemmas within XR. This is the XR Ethics Manifesto, where I start to dig into a great detail for all the different ethical and moral dilemmas about the technology. And the context ends up being a very useful frame for being able to map out all these different dilemmas. Again, if you want more details, you can watch this presentation and other slides. Also, the dimensions of nested context. And nested context is an important aspect of muriology, which I'll get into here in a second. But Lessig says that there's different aspects of cultural norms, the law, the market, and technology architecture and the code. But he has these as kind of independent vectors that are all playing on the user. Whereas here, you can also look at it in terms of nested context. But also virtual reality, augmented reality is all about the context of the real environment. To what degree are you having the virtual augmentation or a complete virtual environment? where you're context switching, where you're in the center of gravity of your existing context and you're adding context on top of it in AR. In VR, you're doing a complete context switch. And there's also different intersecting axes of privilege, domination, and oppression. This is from intersectional feminist thought of looking at different ways in which that people have domination and power and privilege within society. And that, that plays out as a form of context that's kind of embedded into the language and a whole series of different assumptions. And so it's important to recognize the need for both diversity and inclusion, not only in the creation of content, but also making sure that the whole ecosystem is as inclusive and diverse as possible. The only way to do this is to get everybody a seat at the table. So some of the philosophical aspects here, muriology, which I'll talk about, measurement, input, output, context, privacy, ethics, and human rights, and then embodied cognition is a huge, important concept. So muriology is the study of the wholes and parts. And so you have atoms are a part of the molecules, which are a part of the organelles. And you can start to go from the smallest dimensions all the way up to the largest. And that's why using these biological metaphors that you can start to use these concepts of wholes and parts to describe all of the nature of reality. So muriology is sort of like the mathematical structure of process because all processes are happening within the context of larger processes, but they're also often have sub processes 
it basically processes all the way down. And then the Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines Muriology is the theory of parthood relations, the relations of the part to the whole, and the relations of the part to the whole within a whole. So again, some references for the Handbook of Muriology, and Oxford has a new book on Muriology that has more of the history of Muriology. But this was something that Whitehead brought forth in some of his process in reality and really started to popularize it more within the context of philosophy. Even though it's been talked about, you can look at the this book from Oxford to get more of the history. This book called Untying the Gordian Knot, that real-world interactions always have a triad of of cycles of input, output, and context. So for every measurement you have at a quantum level, it always has to take into consideration what the context of that measurement is. You can never have any objective measurement outside of the context. And so, you know, in peer review, you always look at how is this recorded? Does it fit with the contextual expectations? And context ends up being, especially at the quantum level, absolutely critical. And so Eastman is saying you can actually never have real world interactions that are absent of context. Contextual integrity is a huge philosophy of privacy by Helen Nissenbaum, where she starts to define the privacy as the flow of information that is within a normative standard within a certain contextual domain. And so Lessig's pathetic dot theory and nested contexts, again, you can start to look at the broadest context as the earth, then you have the culture, then laws, economy, design guidelines, network architecture, XWare hardware, operating system application code, and then the user experience. And so this ends up being a very useful framework for understanding at what point are you going to address different ethical issues? Is there a technological fix? Is there a cultural fix that has to happen from the culture? Is there something where you have to pass new laws? Or is it something that the market dynamics sort out? And is it in right relationship with the earth? And then again, this is the different domains of human experience. When I ask people the ultimate potential of VR, they usually answer into one of these domains, but it also helps to break out the different domains of the applications of XR and ethical issues as well. This was from Laval Virtual where we did a brainstorm, map these out, and then over the course of 2019, uh, did a lots of different panel discussions to kind of map out a cartography of XR ethics through the lens of context. But you can also look at human rights issues as well as sustainable development goals and the responsible innovation dimensions. These are all contextual domains that you can start to map out relative to each other and start to see how to translate human rights into the domain of VR, which is a big thing that once I get talking here, I'm going to be talking with the EFF, talking about different human rights approaches to XR. Now, the final aspects here is embodied cognition as a series of nested contexts. That's the idea that the brain is in the context of the body and that the body is in the context of the environment. And that both embodied cognition and distributed cognition are saying that no thought is absent of the embodied context as well as the context from the environment that you're around. So that the very nature of how we think is relative to the contextual domains of our embodied experiences as well as the environment. And again, if you look at this contextual nested hierarchy of all the different communication media, then there's a nested domain there. Then the final thing is just the character. These are different aspects of the character that's being exhibited throughout the course of a story. What's the character arc? If you think about a character arc, how is someone growing or changing? What's the quality or the personality characteristics of someone or the feelings and needs when you talk about character motivations and why they do what they do? But this is all about growth and change, and but also gets to the issue of the problem of universals and are those character aspects, are they a property of it or are they fundamental and they're being expressed as some sort of platonic realm of ideal forms? You also have the kairos and the quality of the moment and the archetypal cosmology. And I'd also point to Grant Maxwell, Tracing of Emerging Worldview, that does a deeper dive into different aspects of the archetypal cosmology and lots of process relational approaches into each of the different chapters that he does. There's a context, a quality, a character, and a story. All right, so now I'm going to do a quick run through through some of the different concepts and ideas of process philosophy, and then talk about perception and design, and then open it up for questions. So back in October 31st of 2020, there is a two hour process thought at a new threshold. It was put on by the Cobb Institute. John Cobb was a theologian that helped to take the work from Charles Harthorne and apply process relational thinking to theology. And so a lot of the theologists within the 20th century have really been carrying forth the work of process relational thinking, but there's so many different applications. And there was just a series of 10 minute conversations that were talking about like, 
Christian theology or interfaith or education or science or economics or agriculture, all the way up to like Chinese philosophy. So process philosophy has gone off and had so many different applications and had lots of different influence. And that kicked me off and I did an interview with a Whitehead scholar, Matt Siegel. This was a great primer to get just the basic of all the different fundamental ideas and concepts of process philosophy. And he's also got a book here called Physics of the World Soul. And there's a other book here, Quantum of Explanation, and then Untying the Gordian Knot. These are books that have just helped me get oriented because some of the original source material of Process Reality by Alfred North Whitehead, as brilliant as he is, he's not always the best communicator of his ideas in the way that is clear and understandable. So I've had to rely upon a lot of secondary literature and other people who are scholars and really figured out all of his neologisms and how to navigate the underlying concepts. And so I'm going to share some of those concepts. I've already mentioned how there's a relationality there at the core of it and that there's the process and potential and how there's a sort of a whole part mirrorological set of relations of event sequences as the basis of reality. And then in the Sanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy for Whitehead, it says that there's a number of different quantum ontologies that are inspired by this process relational approach. These are the ones that I mentioned earlier. You can dig into some of those. The foundations of relational realism is the one that I've come across the most in terms of Untying the Gordian Knot, which is actually a book by Timothy Eastman. He used to be a NASA scientist and turned to philosophy in his retirement and is basically doing this massive synthesis of all these process relational thinkers in a book that came out in 2020 called Untying the Gordian Knot. They've been doing monthly discussions about this book and breaking down and bringing in these cutting edge quantum philosophers like Ruth Kastner and Michael Epperson and having these really reach and deep discussions about his book that's been happening for the last seven months now. So I've been really enjoying that sequence and some of this information is coming from those discussions. So a big difference of the existing metaphysical cosmology is that Whitehead disagreed with the ways in which Einstein was spatializing time in a way of creating in a fourth dimension, which implied that all of space-time had already happened, that the universe was already whole, that it was already complete. There was no aspect of novelty, creativity, or participation where whatever we did didn't matter because we're just these deterministic bots that are unfolding in a way that has already happened. And the alternative is that each moment to moment is a moment that is being created, that actually space-time is created out of the quantum potential and that all of the universe is being constructed moment to moment. And that potential is sort of an unfolding process And in that, you have novelty, creativity, and participation where you as an individual have the potential to be in relationship and participation with the universe as it unfolds. So, you know, getting down to the foundations of relational realism, it's going against this classical block world and saying that spatial temporal extensiveness and its metrical structure is emergent from a dynamical topological quantum event structure. So in other words, all of the realities at the basis, the quantum reality, and then from that, we have space-time that emerges out of that. So there's like a non-local field that then somehow is constructed into the space-time that we have, which is the naturalistic world that we live in. And then you have the physical things are the outcome of the real histories of these quantum events. And so you can think about all these physical things are understood as the outcome of real histories of quantum events, and that you have to reconceptualize your ontological and contextual properties as mutually implicative features of every quantum event. So the quantum event basically unfolds and then all of the different processes are being seeded from those events. And again, back to the substance metaphysics and process relational metaphysics, which we've talked about a number of different times. But Kastner, Kaufman, and Epperson have this paper of why quantum potential should be considered as having ontological reality. There's a tendency to want to dismiss the potential and to kind of spatialize it out, like Everett's interpretation, or even the spatialization of all space-time into 140 object. It's the elimination of that potential. And these quantum philosophers are arguing that you should not be collapsing that potential. And I think that's a common theme from both Whitehead and all the process philosophers that I have also seen, is this relationship of potential and the importance of potential. And that the possible events are real, they're not actual, they exist, but they're not in space-time. So this is a a visualization from Kastner that goes into how there's a series of different quantum interactions, and they're kind of doing a handshake. And when they do the handshake, then that's when they actualize, and that's kind of metaphorically the collapsing of the wave function. But there's an actualized reality and the quantum potential that's happening between those two. And again, in the book of Untying the Guardian Knot, there's an application of Boolean logic 
And so the mathematical structure between the two is that there's a combination of a family of Boolean logics where there's a logic of actualizations, which is standard Boolean logic, and then a non-Boolean logic for potentia. And somehow those non-Boolean logics are being projected onto the Boolean logic that we experience, but that there is this non-spatial temporal non-Boolean logic that exists. So again, the actualized reality is the Boolean logic and the quantum potential is the non-Boolean logic. And that there's particle-like actuals and then waves of potential, and then you can go back to the storytelling metaphors where there's different degrees of potential that are embedded into the aspect of storytelling, which is a big part of interactive storytelling. And also been in the past of tribal storytelling and in the future of this more collaborative participatory media that we have in the future. And again, getting down to the time and the nature of time, Hans Primus was arguing that you can't understand time unless you are taking this kind of non bullying approach. So he has this whole thing where he's saying a full understanding of time is not possible within a Boolean logic. And because of that, you have to look at this correlated of material, mental, and temporal domains. He's using the uh, mathematical metaphor of Borean rings, which means that they're all embedded together in this potential. But it gets back to the kairos, and so how there's different aspects of potential that are embedded that's separate and distinct from the, the chronos. Now, Whitehead had an idea of eternal objects, and those objects have the platonic realm and you have somehow the, the platonic realm are interfacing with the physical reality and that's where you have the eternal objects that are those quantum potential so there could be different aspects of the eternal objects in the platonic realm that's in the quantum potential and that would be aristotle's formal causation so ways that there's the mathematical structure and the blueprint of reality that's interfacing with reality when we think about the four different causes from aristotle the formal cause the material cause efficient cause and final cause we have a lot of focus of analytic philosophy and material and efficient cause not a lot of focus of formal cause and final cause. And I think that's one of the other things that process philosophy starts to bring back are different aspects of final causation and theology, as well as this formal causation. And the mechanism of that formal causation are through these eternal objects that are translating the pure potentials and from the quantum potential, and then eventually somehow manifesting into the physical world. All right, and that's through the process of concrescence, which I talked about. And so concrescence is our experience is kind of a stream of elementary processes that are kind of growing together, the feelings into one. So again, this is a metaphor of thinking about how there's all these different dimensions of concrescence that are all coming together. And it's the stream of elementary processes of the many feelings into one. So just as a metaphor to think about the processes that are unfolding. All right, I'm gonna just quickly go through the perceptionist process and designist process. I've talked about these before. You can look at previous things, but just the idea that if process is the fundamental aspect of reality, then you can use process as a metaphor to describe all sorts of things, including perception and design. So there's lots of different models of perception and design. Lots of them have this dialectic between the sensory experience and mental models of reality. So you're going back and forth between your actual experience and then your models of that experience. You know, how we learn, there's different attention, active engagement, error feedback, and consolidation. This is sort of one perceptual loop. And body cognition is another loop, feedback loop between the brain, body, and the environment. You know, the ludo narrative meaning making where there's the meaning that's coming from the designer, the actual system in the experience, and then the interactor. And so you have this kind of Pearson semiotic, triotic relationship between the designer and the interactor. You have the different aspects of another process loop of perception, cognition, and action. So for each of the perception, we're understanding that we're taking action and that XR is intervening at each of these different phases in different ways. You have the unconscious analysis and fusion of all the different input into different percepts at different scales. And so all of our senses are coming in and they're being integrated at different scales relative to each other. And then the predictive coding theory of neuroscience, which is essentially that our brain is a prediction machine. It's have all these mental models of reality, and then you're listening to reality and you're making different predictions around that. But each of these different approaches of perception all have a process relational approach, which is this loop between sensory experience and mental models of reality, as well as the embodied cognition. And then finally, the design is process. You can think about the author design versus generative design, where you have like a waterfall process and an agile process. Anybody that does any like game design or design within the context of computer has moved well beyond the waterfall processes, but we still have different aspects of waterfall processes that are still legitimate in terms of constructing narrative or architectural design. And so it's the fusion of these different types of design practices of the linear approach of the more architectural approach or the film approach, which is more about pre-production, production, and post-production. You know, this is Alex McDowell's way that he spatializes that as a linear process. But more and more, game design is an iterative process where you're constantly iterating, playtesting, and getting feedback. And then the methodologies of Scrum 
and design thinking, all of these have a process relational approach, which is all about iteration and trying to really understand your target audience and then do this iteration between defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing, and really empathizing with who your target audience is, essentially what do they need to do, what do they do, what do they think, what do they say, what do they see, what do they hear, and what do they feel? So this is really tapping into the underlying emotional reality, which is what the basis of the mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics frameworks from Haneke et al. is focusing on the aesthetics and the emotions as a baseline. You start with what you want to have the person feel, and then you design the mechanics and the dynamics around the goal of what you're having them feel. And Mish is talking all about the definition of a medium is addition and distribution. And you can start to look at the progression of these different communication medium. But at the heart, there's new technologies that have new affordances. The creators are creating and exploring the new affordances. And then from there, it's distributed and given to the audience. And then eventually the audience gives feedback. And so just the development of these new communication media and the affordances is this feedback loop cycle between the tech, its affordances, what the artists are able to figure out how to utilize those affordances, getting it into the hands of people and the audience has to learn how to watch them. And then they give this feedback loop. So just the, even the production of the communication process itself is a process. So that's the, uh, the tour of what is experience, the philosophical context for process, experiential design framework, quality story, context, and character a little bit of a process philosophy primer, and then perception as process and design as process. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>